Welcome to Virtual Face-to-Face -face with Dr. Bruce Gerald. I'm Jenna Frick, Senior Media Relations Specialist for the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and filling in for Alex Lukowski as today's moderator. For the past couple of months, the world has been dealing with, one, with the fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the one-by-one one countries across the globe have had to cope with soaring case numbers, overrun hospitals, and a lack of tests and personal protective equipment. In the face of this pandemic, coordinated global support is essential, and low-resource countries on the African continent are particularly vulnerable. UMB Center for International Health, Education, and Biosecurity, or CHEB, has been playing a key role in using resources to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, while also staying consistent with HIV surveillance and treatment programming during this challenging time. So joining us today to talk about how UMB is carrying out the fight against infectious disease and the lessons learned that, that may help guide our efforts at home is Dr. Nadwabi Nadwabi, the country director for CHEB Botswana. And we'll also shortly have Professor Alashley Abimiku join us. She had some technical difficulties, but she'll be in in just a moment. Uh, she's the Executive Director of the International Research Center of Excellence at the Institute of Human Virology in Nigeria and Professor of Medicine for the Institute of Human Virology and the University of Maryland School of Medicine. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Nadwafi, and we'll see Alashley very soon. Thank um, you, Jenna. One more quick thing, this program is being recorded and will be posted on UMB's website. If you want to ask a question, please use the chat function. That's the speech bubble on the bottom of your screen or in the upper right hand corner on a cell phone. When it comes to the time to take questions, listen for your name and I will unmute your mic. All you have to do is speak up. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, we'll try to relay some of your questions as well. Uh, now I will turn things over to our host, UMB's interim president, Dr. Bruce Gerald. Take it away. Thank you, Jenna, and it's a pleasure to be here. And for those of you participating, uh, welcome and being here. I had the great pleasure of working with two people that I consider to be good friends. Uh, one of them is Dr. Ndwapi Ndwapi, who uh, is uh, from Botswana. Uh, and uh, the second is Dr. Elashley Abimaku, who worked with uh, Dr. Gallo early in her career uh, and is now the country director uh, for Nigeria. Uh, and um, these are these are good friends. We spent last year uh, for a week with them in Kenya, and President Perman was with them uh, after that. So there's been a lot of action, uh, and so uh, I think it would be valuable to uh, hear about what they've been doing in their country, uh, not just about COVID, but starting with COVID, but eventually getting to AIDS and other viral diseases that they've been involved with. So, uh, and Dwapi, welcome. And, and maybe you could tell us just a little bit of background about not only you, but also uh, what's been going on with COVID uh, in Botswana. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gerald. And I see um, Professor Abimukis has, has joined us. And, and thank you, Jenna. Um, and, and maybe just to, to start with just a little bit about, about my, myself. I've, I've spent my entire career um, really um, either dealing, mostly dealing with HIV. Um, I finished, I graduated uh, from, internal med, from, from an internal medicine residency in 2001 and immediately went home and, and, and of course um, became immediately involved with HIV. And, and I actually uh, started, uh, helped to start the first uh, sort of public ART clinic in, in, in Botswana. I then spent a number of years um, doing a, a training, uh, just trying to, to, to really sort of clear the way and sort things out for expanding ART therapies. And so I was involved a lot in training. I also uh, went on to manage the national ART program, which now has 320,000 uh, uh, patients. Um, I then uh, had a, a short stint as director of clinical service, the national director of clinical services um, at the Ministry of Health in Botswana, and 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 actually uh, continued to deal with HIV because at at the time of my tenure. Uh, about 70% of our problems in healthcare were, were, were either directly from HIV or, or, or indirectly uh, from, from HIV. I then left the Ministry of Health and joined U.S. universities, various U.S. universities, before um, joining, briefly joining the Ebola um, um, health, health Systems Recovery Effort in Sierra Leone. 
and 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 shortly thereafter I joined CHEB in 2015. So basically, my entire my entire post residency uh, career has really been um, in 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 HIV, uh, both in clinical management and in the management of health services, and 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 just. Just when I thought I had seen, you know, just HIV and and Ebola, there's now a now COVID nineteen. So that's that's my background, and and maybe I could I could pause there for um, a professor to also introduce herself. So uh, Andropi, maybe what you could do is make sure people know what ART therapy is. Not everybody yes. in the audience may not know. Okay, so that's antiretroviral therapy. So this is um, what is the, the triple drug uh, treatment that we use uh, to, in the treatment of HIV disease. And thanks for that. So I, I see we have Dr. Abimaku here, Alashli. It's a pleasure to see we've got the connection working. So welcome again. Uh, tell us just a little bit about yourself because I know you had some training here in Baltimore for a while. Uh, and uh, sort of what you're about, and then we'll talk about COVID in Nigeria. Please. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to join, and I hope everybody can hear me. Yes. Okay. Um, so I, I took a different path from Dr. Duapi. I... Uh, trained as a molecular uh, virologist, and I actually did um, uh, a lot of my postdoctoral training um, in, um, at, uh, at NIH in Dr. Robert Gallo's lab um, initially. And um, really, that trajectory of my, of my um, career path was as a result of having completed uh, my schooling at London School, came back. Uh, to Nigeria, my home country, wanting to really do all of the stuff that I learned um, doing my PhD in London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in London, and found out that I didn't have a laboratory to work in. So, uh, and I spent all my time training medical students in medical microbiology and molecular viro uh, virology. And then an opportunity came uh, in the early days of HIV mm -hmm. epidemic, uh, where they were looking for African scientists to partner uh, with a global world uh, in working in HIV. And, and so I thought that was a great opportunity for me um, to be part of the solution. Uh, this uh, virus was new, it was devastating the whole place. And um, so in early 90s, actually 1991, I got an opportunity to do a postdoc at then uh, Dr. Gallo's lab, which was called Laboratory for Tumor Cell Biology at the NIH Building 36. And, and so I was there, but um, because I uh, left my country as a result of not having uh, the possibility of doing any research, one of the things of the bat that I mentioned and made it very clear was that I would really like to work with the viruses that impact my country as, as part of the collaboration. There are a number of people that work on the viruses in, in America. I don't need to work on that, those ones, but I want to be partner. I want to learn, but I want to work on Nigerian viruses. And I was very lucky to have that opportunity. And in fact, we first uh, isolate and molecularly characterize uh, the, the virus from here in 1994 and published it for the first time, showing that it was very different from what you find in the U.S. and the rest of Europe, and that it was a subtype G, and also that there was a recombinant. So, you know, that allowed me, I, I think, um, the foothold where uh, I continue to work with collaborators also in the U.S. because this became a global problem. So Nigeria was also everybody's problem. So it was really a wonderful partnership that I took up uh, to University of Maryland, continue as, um, as a faculty there, but being very engaged in the, in the, at the, in the Institute's uh, global program and the university's global program. So that's my path. Thank you, Lashley. It's a great path to hear about. And Dr. Gallo is still here, and you're part of his team, aren't you? 
That's a good. That's point. correct. Uh, that's correct, Bruce. So tell us what's happening in Nigeria with COVID, and then we'll hear about Botswana. Yeah, sure. Um, so the uh, like other African countries, uh, the COVID, the first few cases were described uh, sometime towards the mid of February. Um, and it was actually an import. Um, an Italian that came into Lagos uh, was the first described case of COVID uh, in, in Nigeria. Um, and subsequently, he was uh, quarantined for a little while. Um, the uh, Nigeria CDC and CDC uh, sprung into action, identified contacts, and um, isolate them and did all the um, uh, the, the right things to do um, in partnership with WHO and, and Centers for Disease Control that was in the country. And subsequently, we, we had a few cases after that, uh, still limited to Lagos, a very populous uh, city in Nigeria with over 20 million people in just that city. Um, so obviously, you know, it, it really took off fast. But, but you know, I, I think that it would have gone much rapidly than otherwise um, if it wasn't Lagos, because Lagos had a prior history of really containing the Ebola outbreak. It also started there. Um, so the country's epidemiologists and um, emergency response team really sprung fast into action. Uh, they closed the borders really fast. Um, uh, there were shutdowns um, across uh, a few states that responded, that detected uh, cases. Um, certainly, we, the University of Maryland's and Institute of Human Virology uh, program in Nigeria, were pulled in really rapidly uh, to use all of their experience in uh, establishing testing sites for HIV and doing surveillance um, to come in and, uh, and support the government of Nigeria. So we were really in the mix very early. Uh, fortunately, the platform for testing for COVID-19, very, very similar to what we, we had set up in the country for testing HIV. It was the real-time PCR. So, and all of our trained Nigerian colleagues uh, basically uh, turn those uh, HIV uh, molecular labs into COVID testing labs. And then uh, with, the, with the systems, um, the surveillance system, the health informatics system that we had set up, we started partnering with the government so that they began to begin to understand what was going on in the rest of the country and really put up that infrastructure because it, it really spread very fast from Lagos to the rest of the countries. And now all 37 states in Nigeria do have COVID. Um, so we continue to partner with the government in a number of their task force. We've used the health informatics system that we put in the country for surveillance uh, to help with the surveillance. Um, right now there is um, uh, a study that is funded by um, um, by CDC, um, uh, looking at the the uh, prevalence of uh, COVID, but doing it in a very systematic way using the uh, uh, population-based surveillance for HIV that we had done in Nigeria. Use that platform to also begin to look at uh, household. Um, cases of COVID-19 using similar platforms. So we're we're really engaged in the in the heart of it um, all, and um, a number of the clinics that we've worked with, and our Nigerian physician colleagues and healthcare workers are also in the forefront of caring for COVID uh, patients. So um, that's part of the work that we're doing here in Nigeria. That's terrific. Thank you for that, Alashley. Uh, just to remind the participants, uh, we rely on questions from you. So please start putting some questions in so that we have additional ones. One of the comments that I would make from uh, multiple uh, team visits uh, to Africa is when you go to these countries where the University of Maryland Institute for Human Virology 
is represented. You see our name all over the place. It's kind of really interesting uh, to, to, in our case, go to Kenya and see all about the University of Maryland. It was quite a surprise, a nice surprise. So, and Dwapi, tell us about COVID in Botswana. Yes, thank, thank you, Dr. Gerald. Uh, yes, yeah, so the story of, of COVID really um, in, in Botswana should really start with the numbers. Um, Botswana is a small country with a population of 2.2 million. We, we currently have 277 confirmed cases, of which 80%, interestingly, are actually truck drivers who, who were, were diagnosed coming in across the border um, to bring in goods into into the country, so that the number and 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 they've been and and they've been repatriated to to their own countries, mostly South Africa, and 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 so the number of active cases in Botswana is actually stands at at, at 39. We have had one death. Um, the patients are generally young, uh, with mild with, with mild symptoms, and 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 the country's done 50,000. A molecular uh, test to date, which is about 2.3% of the population. But I think the story of Botswana needs to be told um, in conjunction with the story of South Africa, just because of our cultural and trade and a very strong cultural and, and trade ties and, and, and proximity and physical proximity. South Africa, on the other hand, with a population of 58 million, has about 210,000 cases. Uh, with about um, uh, 3,400, almost 3,400 deaths. So that this, whatever it is that we do here in Botswana is going to be very much dependent on the way things go in South Africa, especially as the economy starts to open up and travel restrictions are, are lifted. And, and so where we are now, I think, is a measure of success, given what's going on right next door. And, 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 and really, um, the key elements of, of that success really start with what we did for preparedness, so that right from the beginning, uh, there was a presidential COVID-19 task force that was created, and, and it became, uh, it was chaired by the, the, the state president and became sort of the command center for all the entire uh, 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 response. To the epidemic, so so that it was responsible for national SOPs in all sectors, so health, business, transport, all SOPs to responding to uh, COVID, uh, uh, where where we're coming from this this task force, and it also uh, got into the business of making some projections of some strategic needs such as fuel, and food, and medicines, and PPE, and so on that would be needed during 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 the response and then also more importantly reviewing the legislative framework so that you know a decision needed to be made about whether or not the public health act as it stands was good in, or, or was 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 strong gave the the committee the, the task force enough powers to carry out what they needed to do in response or did, did was there was there need to declare state of emergency? So that was sort of the preparedness um, um, that we that 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 really was the foundation of of our response. And it was followed by it, it was for, well, simultaneously um, we we implemented uh, we were early adopters of the WHO uh, prevention approaches and and used social media um, as as really a vehicle. Uh, for, for for prevention, and we also have a a, a a national director of health services with the powers of a high court judge, so that in circumstances like this, there's a public health act that empowers him, to him or her, to uh, to to really implement whatever measures are necessary to combat this. And then, in addition to that, we did a lot of work uh, towards um, not only. Uh, continuing and expanding prevention, particularly when we had few cases, but also preparing the health system for any onslaught that might come. So auditing for things like oxygen, the PPE, and, and really preparing the beds so that you're looking at not just your hospital beds, but any beds that, that you might need if your hospital system became 
overwhelmed, um, such as looking in, in schools, in motels, in hotels, and, and, and so forth. And then, and then the plan had always been that when we reached, say, six to 25 cases, um, we would then consider uh, uh, the lockdown option to slow down the progression of, of, of the disease, the spreading of the disease, so that the, the country could become more prepared. But before we really got to, to even five cases, I think we were at one or two cases, South Africa really started to take off. And, and we started getting a lot of cases next door. And that really then uh, made us fast forward our plans and, and actually went into lockdown um, in, at the beginning of April, um, uh, really in response to what was going on in, in, in South Africa. Um, so so this, is, this is what we have continued to do. I think our testing capacity, as you can see from our testing numbers, is quite good. Uh, for 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 our population, we were fortunate in that we had had some experience already with PCR technology um, from some of the research work and the HIV work that that has been going on in Botswana. So that our total capacity, testing capacity, molecular testing capacity is about 5,000 tests every 24 hours currently, and and we think that for a small uh, for for our population um, that that is is quite is quite is quite adequate. We have spent a lot of uh, time thinking about continuity of health services. And in that respect, uh, CHEB in Botswana has been at the center of at least the, uh, uh, at least, um, the preparation for, for continuity of health services with HIV AIDS. So that we, we, we did a lot of work towards what it would take to um, what what it would what it would take to to create social distance sorry uh, physical distancing in the facilities uh, and de decongestion and then taking measures to prioritize only those patients that um, that needed um, uh, uh, treatment so that we didn't do routine blood draws when we didn't have to and then and then we instituted uh, things like multi month dispensing which before that had not been done so. So that, that is where we, 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 we are now. I think that we are, we are currently now, we've come out of lockdown and we're slowly opening up uh, the, the economy. And we really need to do that because I think the economic impact um, has been quite devastating. So that if, you know, this feels like the 2008, 2009 downturn where we, 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 we had that economic downturn. And of course, being a mineral dependent economy, um, we, we really had a, a hard hit um, from, from you know, low mineral sales and, and, low, and, and low tourism. Um, however, um, this one feels like it's going to cut deeper. So there is really a, a big need for us to, to, to open up the economy. So, so far, so good. But if you look at the, the, the numbers next door in South Africa, it's clear that I think um, some dark days are ahead of us. I can stop there. I remember a picture that Mike uh, uh, Levine used to show of the uh, border between Mali and the next door country. And it was a, a fence gate and it was wide open and you could walk right through. So yeah. I, I take it that your borders are not quite that porous, that you're able to actually lock it down? In fact, the borders are that porous, <laughs> unfortunately, as, as, um, on both ends, in the north and in the south. So in, in the south with South Africa and in the north with Zimbabwe. And that is really part of the problem. So that in most of the border doesn't have fence, but um, we, we are trying to patrol the borders and, and, and so forth. Great, I see uh, Jenna has told us that we have a, a few questions. Um, so why don't we start with that? Uh, um, uh, Jenna, what's your first question or your first person? Yeah, so our first question comes from uh, Bonnie Bissonette. So I'm unmuting her, go ahead and ask Bonnie. Great, thank you. First of all, thank you very much to both of you for being with us today. It's wonderful to see you. Um, I'm wondering, Alashley, if you could tell us about the number of infections and severity in Nigeria, and is it similar to or different from the situation in Botswana and the U.S.? Could you sort of situate that for us? 
Sure, uh, absolutely. Thank you, Ben. Question. Um, so, following the, the the first few cases that were um, identified in Nigeria, it really rapidly took off. Um, and currently, with uh, in Nigeria, we've got about um, over thirty thousand, actually thirty thousand three hundred uh, cases that have been reported already. Um, there are some uh, cities in in Nigeria that um, are among the top that that really account for probably sixty percent of this, and Lagos is the first. Uh, but Abuja comes really uh, uh, pretty close to it. And then after that, uh, Lagos, Lagos comes with about 11,000 cases, and then Abuja is uh, around 5,000. Then after that, uh, a number of states have about 1.5 um, uh, thousand cases. We still feel um, in terms of death, in terms of total death, we currently have about 700. Um, roughly, that's about 2.2 percent of the of the cases that have been described. Um, we still think that we still think that that is uh, significant for reporting um, because of the uh, limited testing that is going on right now. Uh, because of the vastness of Nigeria, one of the biggest challenge has been. Um, collecting uh, biological samples and getting them to these molecular labs that are situated within the cities. As you know, um, the testing um, platform for COVID, um, it's uh, dependent on real-time PCR and a well-equipped lab with well-trained um, uh, personnel. So, as I mentioned earlier, PEPFA has allowed us to build that infrastructure over years for HIV, and we are able to use that. So, for instance, when it when the first case was described, we had only five testing sites in the country, and and in in about in about five states. Right now, um, there are up to twenty seven. Inside. So within two to three months, there had to be a significant rapid increase because there weren't uh, enough testing sites and people weren't getting uh, their results in time to self isolate. Um, but, uh, but I still think that uh, with, with the number of the challenges that we have, and I don't know, we can go into that later, but um, one of the fears is that. Some of the stigmatization that we are seeing during HIV is rearing its, its head again uh, for COVID. So individuals that are not feeling too well that should come forward and, and get tested uh, are really not doing that. A few that have uh, fallen ill and gone back to the community are kind of saying, well, don't go to that house because it's a COVID house. Um, so, so there are those challenges, but um, we see in our population, it's, it's a much younger population that is bearing the, the, the brunt of the infection. We see largely between 31 to 40, uh, between those age 31 to 40 that are, that are infected. Um, so maybe, maybe that accounts for the lower death rate certainly is uh, half of what we see with the global picture um, that is at about like 4.5 percent we see like 2.2 percent and it has remained steadily even with the increase in in cases but like i said earlier i think we really have to improve our uh, awareness and education in the grassroots um, I think in the cities there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of awareness. There are all the task forces uh, from the presidential to the state to wherever uh, you hear every report every day. There's a report on the television, on the radio, but there are a lot of people in the rural areas that their form of any information is if you if you were ever in Africa during campaigns, you see these buses that go around with the loudspeakers. That's the most effective way of doing this and getting opinion leaders to do that. Now there, I don't think we have done um, well enough. And I hope that 
um, you know, that would um, that would be improved um, to to really make sure uh, we deal with the with the situation we have in hand now, where we continues to see a significant increase in terms of the numbers that are reported a day, even with the under under tested. Right. Thank thank you, Lashley. Jenna, do sure. we have another question? We have another question, and this one is from, uh, I'm sorry, I'm totally going to butcher your last name, Lottie Hakamwa. You're unmuted, so go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, Jenna. Yeah, this is Lottie Hakamwa from Zambia. Uh, my question is for Aki. Um, I'd like to find out um, what phase of the epidemic I think Nigeria is in, and then secondly, how is the COVID pandemic effect in your other work, especially the gains made in HIV work, how is that going to be affected by um, the COVID pandemic in Nigeria? Thank you. Did you unmute me? Um, so I, I apologize, but I didn't hear the first half of your question. I did hear a bit about healthcare workers. The first half of the question was, what phase of the pandemic are you in? Is the curve still rising or is it beginning to flatten? Uh, well, thank you very much for that question. Um, no, unfortunately, it's, it's still rising. Um, the numbers that we are seeing, you know, at the initial part of the, the, the epidemic, we were seeing numbers like uh, 10 to 40 um, a day. Then within a month, we were seeing double digits um, of <clears throat> of over 100, and now we are at a situation where we're getting over 500 cases a day. So again, even with the limited uh, testing, it's still rising. So we haven't flattened at all. Um, one of the things that uh, Dr. Nduapi shared uh, that is happening in Botswana is the difficulty of locking down. And um, you know, if you if if you were ever in Lagos, in Suruleri or in Bala Balogun, I mean, this is masses and masses of individuals and who earn uh, their daily living every day. So it's just hand to mouth. Um, second of all, it's almost impossible uh, to keep these individuals under lockdown, even if it is partial lockdown. There's no electricity. It's really hard. Uh, there's no space to keep the whole family indoors. They've got to fend for themselves. Even the palliative is not very well uh, distributed. So I'm afraid that we're really at a steep uh, tra trajectory in terms of the numbers that we're seeing. Um, the healthcare workers is another unfortunate um, uh, uh, um, um, uh, episode that has unfolded, uh, unfolded over the last uh, few months. Unfortunately for our health work, healthcare workers, a number of them are getting infected. The last data that was shared by the presidential task force uh, put the numbers about 40% of the healthcare workers are getting infected. And, um, you know, there, there, uh, there, uh, we've had Unfortunately, a few strikes within the country uh, because healthcare workers refuse to go on doing this work without getting appropriate uh, gear. Like, a, you know, the, the the country is 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 highly highly populated. Uh, there are supplies coming in every day. The, the the support from the government is at the highest level with the with the presidential task force. The Centers for Disease and Control, like I mentioned, the Nigeria Centers for Disease Control, like I mentioned, shot, like within a month, moved from five testing labs to uh, now we have about 27 testing labs. And still, uh, the numbers keep rising. Um, with the dense, dense population, the rural conditions where the electricity is, is really difficult is, is going to continue to happen. So. Unfortunately, our healthcare workers, a significant number are getting infected. Uh, with our HIV uh, program, um, one of the things that has been emphasized 
um, is the fact that we really don't want to um, exacerbate uh, two epidemics. Uh, the, the, whatever we do with the COVID and responding to COVID cannot compromise the HIV uh, program and reel back all the gains that we've had. Um, so for, for HIV uh, patients that continue to get their, um, their antiretroviral drugs, their AIDS drugs, and uh, fortunately that is moving um, really well. Uh, the testing for the individuals, for HIV individuals, is limited, but they continue to have it if it is um, if it is required. Um, so, so you know, we haven't seen any significant increase in in um, in, in HIV cases. Um, so, you know, um, there is that balance in ensuring that our HIV infected individuals need to get care. Uh, but we really have to do something. As you know, Nigeria has a significant uh, number of healthcare workers, physicians, doctors, nurses, uh, but we really have to do something about um, the, the kind of infection we're seeing in that population, because we need them uh, to really handle this um, pandemic. Thanks, Olashmi. And Lottie, <laughs> good to hear from you. I hope things are well in Zambia, and say hi to Cassidy and David and, and, and Ron. Uh, uh, so it's nice to hear from you. Jenna, you have another question there? Yes, I do. And this one um, is from Catherine Marconi for Dr. Nwapi. Um, she says, uh, you mentioned HIV platforms being shared for COVID response. What might be an example of some of these platforms? Okay, th thank you. Um, thank you for, for, for that question. Um, I, th I think that one of the things, I mean, and this is sort of related to, you know, what is actually happening with the HIV uh, patients. As I, as I mentioned in, in, in my earlier uh, discussion, um, we have been involved, as, as C have been Botswana, we've been involved in, in really formulate, leading the formulation of guidelines for what um, patient care is going to, to look like for, H, for our HIV population. Um, in in the setting of of COVID, and I think one of the, the the platforms that we 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 have used a lot has been has been Zoom, and and we've used that um, to 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 really just um, do training. Um, but what we have now found is that it came in very handy when it came time to not only disseminating the guidelines and 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 the advice of what clinics should do, but also in, in helping them uh, communicate um, a, a lot of their challenges. So, so this was one platform that we've used very effectively um, to scale up uh, the, the training and the coordination in HIV that instantly um, um, the ministry could, could use for, for just about anything um, they needed to um, in 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 the in the event that they needed to use it for 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 COVID, and so and and I think and and I don't I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I think that you know re related to that is this idea of what the impact has been um, that uh, that uh, Professor Abimikus uh, uh, started to 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 talk about, and and here though I think our our impact on 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 HIV I think has been uh, it, it is a little bit worrisome because um, Botswana was one of those countries that um, did, you, you know, sub, uh, really supported its own programs quite a lot. And, and of course, now with the economic downturn that is coming, um, that support is going to go away and we're not sure um, what then, what the consequences will that, that will be for the HIV patients. And I think that also, you know, supply chains have been hard hit. We're a landlocked country, um, and and a lot of our supplies have to traverse other countries before they get here, and and there has been an impact there. And testing is down. Um, HIV testing is down, um, and mostly because of uh, concerns about 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 COVID, and we don't know what's happening in in TB just yet. So there's quite a, a few things that are worrying. Uh, are worrying us. 
um, and, 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 and those now remain to be seen. There are some positive things that I think have happened with COVID, and that is that, you know, in terms of streamlining uh, services to patients in terms of triage and the use of technology and so on, those are changes that COVID has brought that I think will remain. But I think the, the jury is still out really on, on, on what the, the fate of our patients will, will be in the long run. With, with with COVID. Thank you, Andrapi. Thank you. Jenna, another question? Yeah, so um, this next question comes from Fleecy Hubbard. They said they're on a, a patient call right now, so I'm just going to read it for them. Um, they say, thank you uh, all for taking the time for this dialogue today. It's fantastic to hear pre-existing population-based surveillance programs and partnerships um, are pivoting to include the COVID outreach outbreak. Um, so the question is, are there substantial contact tracing initiatives already underway? And if so, uh, what are the primary challenges in implementation and how is UMB supporting these efforts? Okay. All right. So maybe I could, I could, I could take a first stab at that. Contact tracing has been one of the, the, the areas of focus here in, in Botswana. There was, a, there was a point where when we, did, we were not sure whether we had a lot of community transmission, that there was an interest in, in sort of going around and, and doing surveillance um, um, testing within, within the community. But then a decision was made that our resources were better spent doing contact tracing. I think that in the beginning, the contact tracing, um, I think, was 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 problematic in that it was the healthcare workers who were nervous to to go in and do you know the contact tracing and the swabbing and 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 so forth. So in in the beginning, I think we found ourselves dealing a lot with with just the the nerve the fear that that health healthcare workers had you know, with, 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 with carrying this out so that, you know, we, we, we would have situations in the beginning where we would put them up in hotels and, and, and so forth, just to try to manage the fear because you had just a few individuals who were willing to go out and do the full contact tracing as it should be done. I think that has somewhat with education uh, subsided a bit and that we now have more robust teams that are very experienced and are going out and, and can do things very, very quickly. The one thing that we, we, we were unsure about in the beginning was the issue of stigma and, and how contact tracers would be received in the communities. Um, fortunately, um, they were well received and, 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 and allowed to do their job and assisted in, in, in many ways. Um, the issue of, of stigma never really materialized to, to affect the, the people doing, doing contact tracing, even though um, it, it, it really did sort of spill over um, a little bit to, to the people who they were targeting for, for contact tracing. And, and this was a, a particular problem in, in communities because, you know, people do, do come and people in the community do know, especially in small communities, do know who, who people are coming to reach and so forth. And then now with social media, I think it is very easy to, to really carry out uh, and, and really per, per, perpetrate uh, stigma and bullying and almost on you know, social media bullying of people who are involved, um, who are either positive or, or are contacts and, and, need to be, and, and need to be tested. But I think that overall, this has been really our focus it's it's a very resource intensive exercise and so again you know the worry is um uh, as you get more and more uh, community uh, uh, you, you know transmission um is this going to be affordable going forward thank you Antwapi. um I, I was just going to say that uh, I'll, I'll be brief uh, bruce and just just point out that contract and um in, in Nigeria um, uh, actually has moved uh, very smoothly and, and, and that really is uh, based on, a, on two programs. So first is um, during the HIV, um, uh, well, 
earlier on through HIV. There is a program that the government of Nigeria has in place that has been uh, funded really uh, by the U.S. government, the Centers for Disease Control, and that is developing epidemiologists um, within the country, um, and uh, 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 and that um, um, allocated. Uh, following their training to the government's um, epidemiological uh, uh, surveillance unit in each of the 37 states. Um, and, and that has helped outbreaks, especially during Ebola or during Lhasa. These individuals have been the, the foot soldiers that have really gone out and helped um, the NCDC in some of its work. So that crop of individuals uh, that have been built over the last 10 years has really been significant in the contact tracing. So there are numbers you call and NCDC sends them out and they do the contract tracing. So there's yeah. that. The, yeah. the, second, the second part of it is uh, what University of Maryland actually did in country, because um, two years ago we did the National uh, HIV Impact Survey, the population-based uh, impact survey, and that is door-to-door -door, um, contact, uh, uh, contacting individuals uh, for this uh, uh, survey. So that has built a significant amount of tools and health informatics um, that was now available to the government. And all of that cater of, of, of um, systematic arrangement or reaching the grassroots was already there. Because we just did, uh, uh, that was, uh, I mean, uh, this, is, this is the largest population-based survey ever done two years ago. So all of those infrastructure, all of those tools, all of those epidemiologists really came in handy for the, for the COVID. However, based on Nigeria's population, we still have uh, challenges. We really have challenges with educating the grassroots. And I think that's where the stigma is coming in, uh, that these individuals really hear about the stories of COVID-19 and are stigmatized for having it uh, because, you know, um, you cannot go near that person, or otherwise you're going to get infected with that. So at the grassroots, uh, we still face that kind of challenge. And I hope that with more education, uh, with bringing more of the community workers, just like we did with HIV to deal with the stigma, bringing them on board as we're doing gradually, I think it's going to help a lot with that and with education and, and support of the rural areas. Thank you, Elijah. That, that NACE study in Nigeria was a huge study. As I recall, you sampled up to 1%. Was it 1% of the entire population? All around? That is correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah you, over 200,000. And you saw a dramatic reduction over uh, many years. And Dr. Man Sharat, who I know is on this call and director of CHAB, and you and others had a lot to do with that program. That was a great success. So thank you, Bruce. That's very true. Yes. Jenna, you had another question there? Yes, I do. And this one comes from uh, Siad Adan, the director of operation for Xanthia 2020. So uh, you are unmuted. Go ahead and ask. Hi, everyone. Um, so I have two questions. The first question is why is the disease being called coronavirus? Can you hear me? Why is the disease being called coronavirus? Yes, right. Well, uh, lastly, do you or Andropi want to answer that? I, I think the disease is uh, COVID-19 uh, you know, based on the year it was identified as a disease. But the aid itself that causes is called coronavirus SARS-2. Um, so those, that, that's, the, that's the difference. The second, thank you. Thank you, Prof. The second question is, the, the second question is, yes, the second question is, does COVID-19 have disruption on health supply chains in Nigeria? 
does it have a what? Disruption in health supply chain in Nigeria. Yeah, I, I you know, Siad, you bring up a, a really important uh, point. It, it is a significant challenge. I'm not sure about disruption, honestly, because I believe that once the items are within the country, because of this um, very structured uh, task force from presidential to state to the uh, local government organization, to the communities, each state is expected um, to really um, move supplies across each state to where it's needed very carefully. So there are different uh, uh, structures to make sure that the limited supply that come in go to individuals that use it. So for instance, the mask that you and I know that is very effective, the N95, is not found anywhere uh, out on the street. It is restricted to the healthcare workers and the nurses and the doctors that are at the clinic uh, or those that are in the laboratory testing it. So that has been really very, very strict. The challenge we have had is like other countries, ensuring that all of the supplies that is needed is has a way of being shipped into the country. That is our biggest challenge, competing with the rest of the world. And we've got such a huge population of 200 million and just getting enough supplies to come in. But once they come in, because of the structure of the presidential transfer to the state transfer to the local government is really very structured. So um, I, I, I really am very impressed at what is happening to get the limited supplies to the people that require it. But we will need your help, Siad, if you're ever in Nigeria to help us with that. Yes. So uh, thank you, Lashley. Janet, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Do you have another? Yes. Um, this one is from Evezi Okopor. Oko Pokoru, I'm so sorry. I'm like totally butchering everyone's name. Um, so I'm going to unmute you. Uh, and Evezi, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, just to correct, let's just say it's Evezi Okokoru. Thank you. Sorry about that. So, <laughs> yeah, my question is for Botswana. I'm just curious to know about um, the testing. Who gets tested? Is it those who have contacts and have symptoms? Or just any volunteer who calls into a testing center? I just want to see what and what really drives testing in this country compared to what we have in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And and it's a it's a, it's a good question because it has been a matter of debate um, here locally. And and the, the people being tested are, are are really people who are symptomatic and 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 and, and sus, you know suspected or uh, uh, or their contacts. Um, we have, we we did do about six or seven thousand tests in the community where we just picked households in in a high risk community and just and just and just screened the, and just tested uh, you know uh, six thousand people. But other than that, the bulk of the tests have been on contacts and um, and and people who have symptoms. When when you tested those six thousand people who were asymptomatic, do, do you know how often you found a positive? Two out of 6,000. Two out of 6,000. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yes, yeah. The history of it had wow. been that there, there, there were two cases that were found in Zimbabwe who reported having lived in that in that community. And, and this is why this was done. But it turned out okay. there was no, there was no, no, no community transmission there. Alashley, how about you in terms of Nigeria and testing asymptomatic versus contacts and symptomatic people? There isn't there isn't a lot of testing of uh, asymptomatic going on in Nigeria as you expect uh, with the large number as really testing those that fit the clinical profile. Uh, those ones are tested and then the contacts are, are quarantined. So they, they exhibit any symptoms and then they're tested. However, uh, with CHAP, 
um, and the University of Maryland, one of the uh, funding that we recently um, uh, got, and this is under uh, Kristen Stafford, who is uh, faculty, is to 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 um, determine household transmission. So in that case, a number of households are identified and the individuals are being tested. So among those groups, we will be able to determine how many of the asymptomatic contacts um, actually have the, the virus. So that's a very important study that um, University have doing here, uh, that the government is, is really waiting to get the results just to get a handle on the community, community transmission and the household transmissions as well. Right. So, so uh, uh, I know uh, Dr. Perman uh, visited the University of Botswana. I know you have a number, number of universities throughout your countries. What, what's, has your, have your universities been closed to teaching? And what's the plan now that the fall is coming up? Do you, do you know? Right. So in, in the case of University of Botswana, it was closed during the lockdown, but all schools have now been opened in, in Botswana. And so, you know, everybody's sort of resuming a new normal um, um, schedule. Oh, open but remote learning, I'm hearing, not, not physically on campus. No, people are going on campus. Um, uh, schools are free. To, to open up and and and, and admit people uh, on, on on campus. Yeah. Right, Alajli, Nigeria. No, it's, it's still pretty much virtual here in Nigeria, but they are talking about. You know, you, we've got about I don't know 48 uh, universities the last time I counted. Um, so that's a lot of people um, within the the campuses. So it's still virtual, although they have been talking about. Open it up. Even the lower cadre, the primary and the secondary, are, uh, are still virtual. And as long as the numbers keep rising, I think they're going to be very careful about opening those campuses. Yeah, we've been dealing with that here. And what are we going to do? We've been virtual right. uh, for most of our things, and uh, and so the question is, how many people should we allow back on campus, and under what conditions? have allowed researchers to come back. Uh, we've allowed select students to come back. The rest of it has been virtual and, and will remain that way for at least a while. So, so I think we're about out of time. This has been a marvelous hour. I want to thank the two of you. First of all, it's so great to see the two of you again. Uh, and it's so great to continue to hear the wonderful things that the School of Medicine and the Institute for Human Virology are doing uh, in Africa in your countries. Uh, I hope it's long lived and uh, not just limited now to AIDS, HIV, but maybe COVID and maybe some other diseases too. So it's a robust program. Congratulations on that. And I want to just thank you all uh, for giving us an hour of your time. And you didn't even have to fly here. Okay, we could do it over the waves. Wasn't that nice? So. So thank you awesome. all very, very much. And for the participants, thank you all very much for, for being a part of this. So for that, see you later. <laughs>